So I'll just press. And then, Archie, I'm going to, well, I'll just say, um, look, welcome, everybody. And look, Archie's uh, <clears throat> a good friend of mine, and he's a work colleague with mine uh, for the past three or four years. Uh, we're very lucky to have him. Look, Archie's one of the, the leading coaches in Ireland. So, um, look, I'll hand over to him and let him handle it. And uh, if everybody at this stage can just unmute them or mute themselves, and then when Archie needs you in, you can mute. Is that all right? Brilliant. Okay, Tom, thank you so much. And ladies, thanks very much for coming on. I'm delighted. I was delighted actually when Tom asked me uh, to, would it be interested in coming on to chat to you. Um, and I'm, I'm, I jumped at the opportunity, to be honest, because I think what you're doing is great. And I think it's it's super. People take, and, and that's what today's workshop is about. This evening's workshop is about taking control taking control and sometimes we can let ourselves, me included, get ourselves out of control and, and a whole lot of things we do. So fair play to you, you're taking the bull by the horns. Now, what I want to say to you is this evening's workshop is very informal. So listen, there's going to be a bit of banter, there's going to be a bit of crack. Now, all I'm saying is don't leave me standing here, nobody answering questions and there's no right or wrong answers. We're just, it's just, we're going to have a bit of interaction a bit of, and a bit of crack with it because Sometimes we'll be talking about fairly serious things, but I still think that the best way to learn and things to stick is to have a wee bit of humour with it and a bit of and a bit of banter. So non-judgmental, lots of conversation, and and we'll take it from there. All right. So just just bear with me. So uh, hopefully you should be picking up all my slides there on the screen. So uh, my wee business is called AB Coaching Life and Sport Limited. Just to give you a quick insight to what we do in in the business uh, side of things. I have about 20 full-time sports coaches that go in and out of schools and clubs and youth clubs and all over the place. And they're out every day of the week coaching. And they're, a lot of the coaching uh, is a physical literacy program where we're developing all the physical literacy movement skills to be able to do play any sport, to be able to go to the gym and do it properly and not get hurt. You know, all the simple wee skills that we need to be able to take part in sport or a athletics or any sport team game. So that's that side of the business. But then the other side of the business is the life coaching side of the business. Now, currently, I do this all myself. It's that sort of wee thing where you don't really, you have your own way of doing things and you don't really know how anybody deliver your own material. So uh, I do all this myself. I go into primary schools. I do mindfulness. I do wellness there. I do transition programs. I do staff stuff. I go into post-primary and I do work with year eight's trying to settle in and uh, you know getting students ready for exams and motivation to study and even at stages I go in and do work getting students ready for university and scaring their living shit out of them about what really happens in Belfast but that's my job and to have them maybe to, to start conversations with young people that maybe parents maybe don't know how to start or don't know how to continue or where whatever to encourage young people to talk and have these conversations at home. Uh, so that's sort of the, the side of things that, that I work at. So the way I envisage life and the, the amount of times I've been working with people, and it's deadly to be back on the, online. During lockdown, I would have done five of these workshops a day for about 18 months. So with poison looking at the screen, but it's a bit of a novelty be, being back at it today. But the, when you get involved and do the sort of work I do, a question that I get commonly asked is, oh, Archie, how do you look at life? How do you envisage life? What a question to ask anybody. But I, I, I had to come up with an answer and I had to sit down and give it some thought. So I envisage life like a journey. That's just the way I look at it. And a journey, a one big long journey with a start and a middle and an end. And unfortunately, like every journey, it has to come to an end as it will for us all. But that large journey is made up of a whole load of wee small journeys. So it could be a journey in work, it could be a journey in a career, it could be a journey in a relationship, it could be a journey in sport, it could be like, like this journey that, that you're just getting on here now uh, with, with Tom in Satanta. So we're going to talk about the journey, but, but we're not going to talk about a sport journey or school journey or relationship journey. We're going to talk about a rela or a, 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 an aeroplane journey, okay? So what I'm going to do here, just for one minute, I'm going to stop sharing and I'm going to share 
my whiteboard, if I can do that. Now, let's see. Open that up again and go whiteboard. Okay. Can everybody see that? We can. Okay. Tom, give me a thumbs up if you're picking up that whiteboard. Yeah. No, that's yeah. Great. There's that scribble Tom made there when we were when we were getting warmed up. So we're picking up the whiteboard. I'm just gonna rub where's the rubber? No. There's the rubber there. I'll just rub that out. Okay. So we've got a red X down here. All right. And that red X is Belfast Airport, right? I'll just put a B beside it. And everybody knows where the airport is in Belfast. That red X up there. Okay, I'm going to pick Sharon because you were the, the talker of one. Sharon, you can actually, you, you can use your mouse or whatever you're using there to be able to move the wee pen. But I want to ask you a wee question first, Sharon. So I'm going to change the color for you. I'm going to change the color to blue. All right. So, Sharon. Mm -hmm. Thanks for, for coming on. So, well, that's Belfast Airport. The other red X is the airport wherever you want it to be. All right. So I'm going to ask you a question. Tom's going to pay. Where do you want to go? Where do Barbados, you want to go? Barbados. Barbados. You want to go to Barbados. Okay. Mm -hmm. You want to put a B up there. And I'll put I'll put B A R, but that's not the bar, Sharn. That's Barbados. <laughs> okay. So Sharn, what I want you to do, are you able to move the are you able to move that about there the, on the screen? You able to access that whiteboard? Good. Yeah. Right. Now, Sharon, this is what I want you to do. As long as your journey starts in the airport in Belfast and finishes in the airport in Barbados, I want you to draw the flight plan for your plane. How is it getting from Belfast to Barbados? I'm giving you five seconds. Are you ready, Sharon? Yeah. Okay. I'm just going to draw it. You draw it. Five, four, three, two, one. Um, no. I'm stop. Give her a clap. Everybody mm -hmm. give her a clap. Well done, Sharon. Give myself a clap. Okay. I'll give you a clap. Good girl. Now, <laughs> let me see. Can I go back in here and get a different color? Brilliant. Now, tell me this, ladies. Why, why did I let Sharon, Kira? why did I let Sharon pick? If Tom's paying, why did I let Sharon pick where she wanted to get to? Don't forget to unmute now, girls. Kira, have you an answer first? Uh, no pressure on her. All right, but I let her. I let her pick. Why did I let her pick if somebody else is paying? <laughs> Don't know. <laughs> Whose journey is it, Kira? Sharon's journey. Sharon's journey. A Sharon's journey. That's why Sharon got to pick, and that's why each and every one of you in this chat room tonight get to choose what you want out of tonight's workshop. And more importantly, what you want when you finish a program with Tom. All right, this particular one you're on. You might want to jump on to the next one or level up or whatever, but only you choose your destination, what you want to get out of it. And it's the same with any journey. Same thing. Why did I let Sharon draw the line? If Tom's paying, why did I not let Tom draw the line? Because it's Sharon's journey. And Sharon and every one of you ladies in this room tonight already have a plan. You already have a plan subconsciously in your head how you're getting to the end of this program. So that's 100%. And like Sharon, you picked a fairly bar that we squiggle in the middle, Sharon. When we plan journeys, we usually take the easiest road. We plan a simple journey. And that's very normal what Sharon done. Now, tell me this. Milena, can you unmute? All right. So remember, this is a, an aeroplane journey. Mm -hmm. What would cause an aeroplane journey what would call it cause an aeroplane to come off its planned journey? So what sort of things happen that would cause an aeroplane to come off its planned journey? Storms. Brilliant. So I'm going to put a green X there, right? And that's a storm. Now, ladies, I want you to think about a storm. We don't get much warning about storms. Do we really know how bad a storm is going to be until we're right slap bang in the middle of it and it slaps you up the face? We don't really know how bad it's going to be. Okay? So... That's one. And what that storm represents in any late journey and anything else are two things. One is stress. And stress is very, very normal. All right. And it comes to us all. And the way of life is we just have to deal with it. And the other thing that that storm represents is setbacks. A setback. Something that you haven't planned for. A family bereavement. 
an illness in yourself so you can't see through the program. Uh, and any setback, anything, a relationship breaking, anything that can happen that you didn't really plan for or we don't really plan for. So that's what, let me see who else I have down here. Uh, Lisa, Lisa, what else would cause an airplane to come off its planned journey? So Melina gave us a real good one there, a storm, but what, what else would cause an airplane to come off its planned journey? Maybe if it's like running out of fuel or something. Okay, maybe running low on energy. Brilliant. It's not the one I'm looking for, but... <clears throat> Turbulence caused by bad weather. Yeah. What What could it... Could a, could a plane crash? Yeah, potentially, yeah. Right, right. So what could it... Don't say a tree now, because it's, the journey's on. It's up, the plane's up in the air. What could it crash into? Another plane. Ah, <laughs> yeah, you've got it. Okay. So that green X there represents another plane and for some really strange reason somebody in Barbados wants to go to bloody Belfast but that plane's coming the other direction and Sharon's plane's going this way and a another plane's coming this way what's going to happen Lisa if, if none of those two planes move they're going to crash they're going to crash there's going to be conflict there's going to be catastrophe and there's going to be consequences Mm -hmm. All right. Brilliant. And what that plane represents in life and in any journey is adversity. And adversity is when somebody or something gets in your way. And, and, and in, in my experience of life, there's loads of people and things out there that want to get in your way. Okay, so hold that thought. And thank you to the ladies that have contributed already. So I'm going to go back to this red line. So the black line is the way Sharon plans to get to Barbados. But this red line is her actual journey. So watch this, and I'm going to draw it. Here it is. Here she is today. Now, there's the red line. Okay. Now, Sharon doesn't even see the storm. She doesn't even know what's there. She hasn't even picked it up on the radar. Can anybody in the room, Avine, can you tell me, Avine, why is Sharon in great form? Why is she buzzing? Why is she happy? Because she's focused. She right. where she's okay. going. She's focused. How do you know she's focused by looking at the two lines on the page? She's going in the right direction. <laughs> Brilliant. Remember, there's no wrong answers here. She's going in the right direction. The journey started and she's a wee bit closer to Barbados than she was two days ago. But why is she in real good form I mean, what line is the red line close to? The black. Brilliant. And what's the black, I mean? Uh, A guide. The plan. She's buzzing. Sharon's buzzing because everything's going to plan. Okay, and that happens at stages in any journey. We'll be buzzing because things go to plan. But Sharon, you've looked ahead now, Sharon, and you spot this storm. Now, Sharon, do good pilots fly their very, very expensive planes through the middle of bad storms? No. What do they do instead, Sharon? They take a detour. They take a detour or they try to go around it. Brilliant. So let me see then. Watch. So Sharon decides, I'm going to go around that bloody storm. I'm not flying into it. And it knocks her a wee bit off track. Now Sharon's up there. Sharon's up there, guys, but she wants to be here. All right. And don't say, no, Archie, why doesn't she just fly straight from there over to Barbados? Because she can't finish the program unless she does the things that have to be done along the way. There's things in the journey that have to be done along the way. So Sharon's up here at this red squiggle, and she wants to be here. Now, Sharon, who's flying that plane? Me. Oh, good girl. I'm glad you didn't hesitate. <laughs> yeah, Sharon's the pilot. Kira, who's flying your plane? Me. Good. Campbell, is that who Campbell is? That? I don't like you calling your, your, your uh, surname, but uh, who's playing your plane? Oh, that is my first name, but I'd like oh, to think you're playing their plane. Good. Okay, Campbell. So you're yeah. playing your own plane. Super. And guys, this is something we'll have to come to the realization with. We're flying our own plane. So, Sharon, if you're telling me you're the pilot and you're up there and you want to be down here, whose job is it to get you there? Tom's? No. Mine, mine. Good girl. Good girl. 
And this is something I have to realise. That we're flying the plane. I'm somewhere. I've been knocked off track. I've missed a few days. This isn't going well for me. But it's my job to get myself back. So Sharon calls on all her strength, all her inner power, all her experience. And really quickly, she gets herself two or three things and she's back on track. And she does it all by herself. And once again, Sharon's journey continues, not veering too far off its course. And she's well over halfway through the program now. She's well halfway to Barbados. But now she spots an airplane sitting in front of her. All right. And it's a what she's coming this way, the other plane's coming that way. And Kira already told us, or somebody told us, what's going to happen if the two keep going? It's going to be a crash. Sharon doesn't want to crash. So what are you going to do, Sharon? We're doing another wee deed here. We're doing another wee deed here. Now, look where this one knocked you, Sharon. For Jesus' sake, you're nearly as far away as you started. But do you know why that knocked Sharon away down into the, this corner, guys? Remember I told you what that represented? Adversity. Somebody or something getting in your way. Now, if it's somebody, that's another person. We perceive that per as a personal attack. And that's, they're the ones that can really knock you off track. Okay? Now, Sharon, you're the pilot. Whose job is it to get you back on track, Sharon? Mine. Okay. You're going to call on all your experience and all your past and all the, the inner strength like you did in the last occasion. But watch what happens to you this time. What's she flying in, Campbell? She's just spinning in circles. She's flying in circles. And sometimes we can feel like this, that we're just spinning round in circles and not making any headway. And the reason that is, is because maybe we don't have the skills. Maybe we don't have the past experience. Maybe this is the first time we've actually really experienced adversity. So you're flying the plane, Sharon. Put your wee hat on. There we are. You are take the steering wheel, you know, the funny shaped steering wheel, press all the buttons. Mm hmm who does a co-pilot have, or who does a pilot have sitting over here? The co-pilot. Co-pilot. Now, what's the job of a co-pilot? Let me see, can I talk to somebody on down? Uh, Louise, what's the job of a co-pilot? To support the pilot. Okay, that's a good one. Maria, can you give us another one? Another word. What does a co-pilot do? Just to keep them right. Brilliant. Keep them right. <laughs> support them. Guide them. Mentor them, uh, motivate them, help them, take over for them sometimes. Put your arm around them. Now, who in who have you got? I don't need a, an actual name, but a group. What group of people do you have that could be a co-pilot for you? Each other. Each other, right? The people that you're going to the gym with and sweating bucket loads with, for sure. Come on, everybody else, unmute and come in and tell me. Family. Family. Any family member? Tom. Yeah, you're right. I know you. somebody laughed when I said Tom. Tom, your mentor, your person in the gym, all right? The person that's there for you. So family, friends, colleagues, coaches, mentors, tutors, anybody. Anybody, number one, who's willing to be your co-pilot. And the biggest one, guys, is Anybody that you're willing to let be your co-pilot. Sometimes we, we turn co-pilots away, and I have done this in the past. Now watch what happens to Sharon, who's been spinning here in circles for three weeks. Watch what happens to Sharon when she gets the help of a co-pilot, or two, or five, or ten. She gets in there, and then she gets up here. Give her a clap, please. Give her a clap. Well done, Sharon. And we're clapping, guys, because Sharon got to Barbados. She got to her destination. But Sharon, when you look at that map or that image, is the red line the way you wanted to get to Barbados? No. No, you planned a fairly simple black line up the middle of the screen, which is very, very normal. All right. Now, Milena, do, does every journey go to plan? No. No. So be ready. Be ready, no matter what the journey is that you're on. Maybe this journey you're thinking of, that you're going through with Tom and Satanta. It may be a journey in a relationship. It may be a journey in a career or an education or in anything. Be prepared, because all journeys do not go to plan. 
Sometimes they do, and we get lucky. But along the way, and excuse my language, but shit happens. Whether that be, whether that be setback, whether that be stress, whether that be adversity. But this is where we become, this is where we become uh, more resilient. So I'm just going to get rid of that whiteboard. Well done. And I'm going to just share again. Okay. So I'm picking that back up. Tom, going to get fine. Thumb up. Yeah. Brilliant. So, but guys, and, and people, I'm not going to start telling my story, but it, things that have happened in my life came in my past and, and all the rest, they're actually, I consider them as my superpower. I'm talking about the bad days. I'm talking about, you know, losses. I'm talking about bereavement. I'm talking about failures. I'm talking about th things that weren't a success, that the things that knock you down and kick you up the arse. They're my superpower. They are my superpower. And that's the way I look at them. And it takes a lot to rattle me. It takes a lot to rattle me because I ha there has been so many things that have went on in my life in terms of loss. I lost my mother, which was 48. I was 21 years of age, trying to raise two, two wee boys in the house. And I was only really a cub myself. Uh, and in sport and all those things. But if you can change maybe how we think about them things and don't look at them as a failure, but look at them as learning. That's massive learning and use that as your superpower. And that's the way our resilience works. So in terms of resilience, and this is something that you're going to have to call on. By the sounds of listening to Tom over the last number of weeks, this program is going to be tough because we want big gains. So you're going to have to call on your resilience at, at times through it. But what is resilience? And I have this wee bugbear because I go out into schools and I can hear teachers and staff that are talking about resilience. And then when I sit down and have a conversation with, with them about it, they didn't really understand it. So as you can see on your screen now, that's really what resilience is. And I suppose the key points here is number one, uh, folks, is it's individual. So your resilience is totally and utterly unique to you. It's not the same as anybody else's in this room tonight. It's not the same as anybody else's in this country, country or anybody else's on this planet. This, your resilience is totally and utterly unique and individual to you. You might have a twin sister, you might have a twin brother, and you think, oh, we experience everything the same. You don't. And the reason that is, is because our resilience continuously fluctuates, just like my hand, up and down, up and down, all depending on what's going on in your life and how you perceive it. You know, so you could have got up this morning, you could have had a good night's sleep, you could have got up this morning, and you might have had a bit of a barney with somebody in the house this morning before you went to, to the gym. Automatically, there may have been a bit of a row and a bit of a shout about what the hell, and we're looking at the state of this house this morning, and there's a bit of a row. The next thing is your resilience takes the wee dip. And then you get to the gym, and you meet somebody there, and you've had an acquaintance with them, and saying, hey, I think you've lost a few pounds already. You're buzzing, you're knocking it out the day, girl. And the next thing is your resilience raises another wee bit. And as we go through our day and how we perceive things, our resilience continuously bops up and down, fluctuates. So that's a very, very important uh, thing to remember is that our resilience continuously fluctuates. Now, I've, what I've done is I've broken resilience down into two parts for you, two key qualities. So the first quality is this quality that we call bounce back ability. And this is the ability to recover after a setback, after periods of stress, after adversity. So I want everybody to read what's on the screen. I'm not going to start reading that out, but I want you to look at the picture. So Maria, what do you see in that picture on the screen? Need to unmute, Maria. All right, we'll come. All right. Sorry, sorry. I can you hear me now. What do you see on the picture? Just a child with a ball. Right, focus on the ball, Maria. Tell me, Maria, where would you find one of those balls? Um, in the gym. In the gym. <laughs> Anywhere, yeah. And in a gym or in a class, in a, okay. an exercise class. Brilliant. And do you know what I have five children, Maria? You know what else you see them balls? 
I work at that job, so I'm well used to seeing them, Jim, them balls. Oh, the maternity ward. Yeah. Yeah, I, for about 10 years there, I had res, residency in the midwifery lead unit in Craig Avenue. Um, <laughs> so, yes, what sort of things do people do on them balls? They sit on them, the balls take weight, all that sort of stuff. So they're pretty playable, all right? So, Marie, I want you to think, if I had that ball here in my hand, Maria, right, and I'm holding it out there level with my eyes, right, and I took that ball and I've done this with it, look, boom, and I punched it down into the floor. What sort of a bounce would it get off it, Maria? It'll come back up to you. Would it get a big bounce or a small bounce? Well, depending on how fast, how hard you throw it down, it'll be a good good well, bounce, yeah. I'd give it a good hard push, so it'd get a big bounce back off it, right? Thank you, Maria. And guys, I want you to visualise that blue ball as your resilience. And there's big learning in this because your resilience works exactly the same way in, in parts and then in other parts not. So... The first thing I'm going to say is that blue ball, because of the nature of it, it had to hit the floor before it bounced back. What I'm going to say to you tonight, folks, is your blue ball, which is your resilience, doesn't have to hit rock bottom before it bounces back. You don't have to go to the pits. Everything doesn't have to be totally crap before you recover. Your ball can take a bit of a dip and can bounce back, all depending on how resilient you are. It can go down into this mid zone, which is called the depression zone. So, so there's three zones, the safe zone, the depression zone, and then the suicide zone. So your resilience can sometimes doesn't even have to come out of that safe zone. You can take a wee dip and then you can recover. Me personally, and I'm fairly well in touch with my resilience. Me personally, I actually have to go to the depression zone before I recover. Believe it or not, because... And, and then people say to me, oh, come on, Archie, how, how do you know you're in the depression zone? Because I know my body. I know how I'm thinking. I know where my motivation levels are. I know I'm feeling a bit sluggish. I know I'm coming into the house and usually I'm all, I don't be at home much because I'm heavily involved in sport and I'll be out in the evenings and stuff. I know if I come in and I'm hitting a school bag, I boot up the hall and letting a roar. I mean, you, you, you're the homework done. Get that phone out of your hand. I'll throw it right into the yard. And I'm going, Jesus, that's not me. So I know I'm irritable, I'm agitated. I'm feeling a bit sluggish. I'm not, I'm, I'm, I'm not even, sometimes I'd be fairly cautious about, ah, oh, I'll not eat that because, you know, I'll not eat too much or whatever. I'm just firing stuff into me and I'm all over the place. And I know my resilience levels, there's my signs and my symbols for myself that my resilience levels have dropped. I'm sitting in that depression zone, believe it or not. And that's when I, that's my trigger to go, get me the hell out of here. What do I need to do? I'm going to talk to you about that in a wee minute, about what I do. So that was one, oh, sorry, I'm going to go back there. That was one quality of, of, of resilience is you don't have to hit rock bottom, okay? But I want you to think about that ball, all right? And if I said to you, your ball never goes flat, what can a ball, Louise, that never goes flat always do? Bounce. Bounce. So I'm telling you today, everybody in this room tonight, on this workshop, your ball never goes flat. Never. You never lose the ability to bounce back. You do once when you're dead. Who late? But that's fine. But I'm talking about you could be in that depression zone and you can get out of there because you know you can bounce back. You could be in the suicide zone. You could be in there for six months. You could have all your plans made and what you, you can get out of there. And that's why sometimes I fall out with people. And I fall out with people that I hear saying, I'm not wasting any more time on that one. They're a waste of time. Nobody's a waste of time. Nobody's a waste of time because we all know now that no, your, your, your resilience, your ball always bounces back and you can get out of that wherever it is you're in. Okay, so there's two big messages about, about bounce back ability. Then, guys, we have the second quality of resilience. And this second quality is the quality of stickability. All right? Once again, read the text. But I'm going to be asking you some questions now. Have a look at the picture. Campbell, can you describe to me what you see in that picture? Hard work. <clears throat> All right, but I know, don't, don't look beyond the picture. Just, just catch face. Say what you see. Um, just a, a boy climbing up a mountain or something, is it? Brilliant. There's a wee boy climbing a mountain. Avian, what's he using? Uh, like a ski pole. Right, he's using a stick. And guys, our eyes are always drawn to that stick. 
because that's the best thing that he's got. But Louise, what else is he using? His hands. His hands. What else, Louise? Keep could keep it coming. His feet and his legs. Mm. Brilliant. And people in this course, tell me, am I making a bad statement when I say that wee boy is using whatever he's got to get where he wants to go? Is that a true statement? If it's not, please unmute and tell me. All right? He's using whatever he's got to get where he wants to go. He doesn't have a whole pile. Please don't forget what he's doing. He's climbing a mountain. There's risk. He could slip. He, he could fall. He could smash his face off the stones. He could, this potentially could die up there. He's making do with what he's got to get where he wants to go. But Sharon, where do you think he wants to go? Top of the mountain. He wants to go to the top of the mountain. And, and what's telling you that, Sharon? What's What's crying out at you? What's telling you that he wants to get to the top of the mountain? Well, that's the direction he's pointing. Brilliant. That's the way he's traveling. Now, I know you can't see his eyes, Sharon, but where do you think he's looking? He's looking at the top of the mountain. He's looking at the top of the mountain. His eyes are on the prize because, folks, nothing else matters. Nothing else matters. His eyes are on the top of the mountain. That's where he wants to get to. Okay, and that's the end goal. Like Sharon telling us, she wants to go to Barbados. That's fine. His destination may be a wee bit different. Now, I want you to imagine, on his next step, he overstrides. He puts his foot in the wee hole, and he's not sure what's in there. The ground starts to crumble from beneath him. He reaches, he's losing his foot, and he's about to do the splits. He reaches for a tuft of grass. He didn't check it. Bang, it comes out in his hand. Down onto his face. The blood's running out of his nose. He's cut the knees and the elbows of himself. I want somebody in the room to tell me. How's he feeling? You're him. How are you feeling right now? Lisa, how are you feeling right now? You're laying curled up in a wee ball up that mountain. Sore. Pain. Sore. Maria, how would you be feeling? Might want to turn back. You might want to turn back. You have question. You might want to give up. What about you, Campbell? How would you be feeling? Sore. Sore? A bit dejected. And a bit dejected. Brilliant. And guys, sore, a bit dejected, annoyed, pissed off, a bit depressed. Maybe you feel like a bit of a failure. Maybe you feel that you've let yourself down. Maybe you feel you've let the photographer down. You come up there to take that picture and now you're starting with blood running out of your nose and your elbows all cut. And by the way, folks, they're all very normal feelings when we fall, when we feel we fail, when things don't go how we expected them. All right? So, five minutes have passed. Milena, what's he doing now? Uh, trying to figure out what to do next. Okay. Right, that's you. You figure out what you're what you're gonna do next. What are you doing? Keep going, just yeah, keep going. That's the key. You roll up two big lumps of bog roll and you stick them up your nose and stop your nose from bleeding. And you get the plasters on your knees and on your elbows. And you learn from your mistakes. And that wee fella there, when he steps forward the next time, he'll not put his foot in a hole where he's not sure what the ground's like. He'll not reach for a tuft of grass when he's not sure that it's not rotten. Does that make sense? That's what stickability is, guys. No matter what happens, no matter what happens along this program for you, no matter what happens, you just stick with it. And you get it done. And that is another job or, or another role that our resilience plays within us. So we're going to play a game. Now, everybody listen. Everybody keep an eye on the screen and just listen what's happening. So, as I see people starting to get a wee bit agitated there, moving about the place and all the rest. So I'm going to just get you tuned back in again. So here's a wee game we're going to play, right? In this game, all right, eyes on me, in this game, all I'm going to ask you to do is touch two different things in the room, right? Now, but there's two rules. The first rule is you're not allowed to touch another person in the room. Does anybody else in that room with you? You're not allowed to touch them. They don't count. And eyes on me, 
you're listening, you're not allowed to touch your own body. So you're not allowed to touch anybody else and you're not allowed to touch your own body. But what I want you to do as quickly as you can, I want you to get up off your seat and I want you to go and touch two different things, hold them for two seconds and sit back down on, the, on your seat again. Ready, go. Quick. Brilliant. Okay, Tom, what did you touch? He's been asleep. You know, calculator and he's knocking. Right, Lisa, what did you touch? The television and the fireplace. And Lisa, what did you use your hands, did you? Yeah, my hands, yeah. Good stuff. And uh, Avine, what did you touch? A water bottle and a coffee cup. Good stuff. And you used your hands, I assume? Okay, guys, and just to save going through everybody, because I watched your boy the people that had their camera on. We all touched a variety of different things, but the one thing we had in common was we all used our hands. We all used our hands to touch. All right? Why? Because we're creatures of habit. We are creatures of habit. And I sort of brainwashed you because there's a hand on the screen, and I said, don't touch your own body. I use my hands, all right? But we are creatures of habit. And the major resource that we have to solve the problem of touch is our hands, okay? And that's totally fine. Now, this is what I want you to do this time. I hope everybody in here knows what a chainsaw is. I want you to imagine I just started up a big Husqvarna chainsaw. And I've come around each and every one of you, cut, them off, cut you off here, look, at the shoulder there, and at that shoulder there, cut your two arms off, right at the shoulders. So now you don't have any hands and you don't have any arms. Same game, same problem, same rules. Go and solve it. Go. Use your feet. You use whatever the hell you want, Lisa. As long as you don't <laughs> use your hands, but there you don't have any hands. <laughs> okay. So, Kira, what did you use? Use my feet. Use your feet. What did you touch? Hit a door and a bedside locker. Okay, you used your feet. Uh, go on ahead then, Lisa. Tell us all what you touched. You didn't touch pen. You never moved off the couch. But I know how. I know how to touch it. I touch it with my feet. The TV okay. and the and Campbell. What did you touch? Pen and a hanger. And what did you use? My elbow. I, I Campbell. I'm very sorry, but you don't have any elbows. I cut you off at the at the shoulder blade. <laughs> oh, you're okay. a bit higher up than I thought. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So, folks, I took away your hands. I took away the automatic. I took away the easy. I took away the, the creature of habit. Everybody in the room solved the problem. And that is the easiest example I can give you of stickability. All right? Remember, every one of us used our hands the first time. We found another way to solve the problem. And that's what stickability is. That's what stickability is. And I try to use a statement, and I try to live by it. I try to live by it as a husband, trying to be a good husband, a good father. I try to live by it in business. I try to live by it in sport. And that statement is, there's always another way to solve a problem. Think outside the box. Come at it from a different angle. Get comfortable being uncomfortable. Okay? Now, everybody sort of used their feet. I was waiting to see, to see somebody using their head or doing something that wasn't that comfortable. Get comfortable being uncomfortable. Push yourself out of your comfort zone to, to create a new comfort zone. And that's where your stickability will kick in. Okay. And that's, remember, one of the big jobs that our resilience plays within us. Now, remember earlier on, I was saying to you that sometimes I find myself in that depression zone. And then I start realizing I'm in there. And then I have to work like hell to get myself out. This is how I do it. And this is one of the tips I would I'd really share with you tonight is you have to create a list. And this is what I call a list of protective factors. The factors in my life and lifestyle that protect my resilience, that create that upwards push. All right, when your resilience dips, it pushes it up, it keeps pushing it up. So my list, and this isn't my list, because my list is very personal to me, as will yours be to you. But here's some things that might belong on your list. Okay, and I'm not going to read them out. I'm not going to read them out, but you can have a look at them. So what do, questions do you have to ask yourself about your things on your list? Then no, the first one is, is there enough on my list? 
is there enough protective factors in my list, in my life, and in my lifestyle? Okay, what you're doing on this program is a massive, massive protective factor. Getting up early in the morning, getting a routine, getting to the gym, getting your shit done before I'm even out of bed. So Tom says, but what I'm saying to you guys is this is a massive protective factor to your resilience. It makes you feel good about yourself. It makes you feel good. It, it releases all them endorphins and everything, but that alone is not enough. So you have to do this wee piece of analysis on yourself and find out what's on my protective list. What are the things in my life and lifestyle that are building me up? Then, guys, you have to ask yourself, how do I strengthen them? That is there, but can I strengthen it a wee bit? Can I talk a wee bit more? Have I got somebody to seek help? Have I got somebody I can chat things out with? Do I have a set goals? Do I have a sense of belonging somewhere? Am I more of a, an optimist? Do I be optimistic about things and see the good in things? So that's one task for you, is to create that protective list. But also, you have to create one of these lists, and this is the hard one to create. This is a list of risk factors. So these are the factors in your life and lifestyle that push your resilience down. Okay? They're not asking for help. They're bottling things up. They're not taking control of your emotions and your worry and your physical health and all those things. So what I would say to you guys is create these two lists. Now, what are you trying to do with your risk list? You're doing a really fair analysis on yourself. And what you're doing, trying to do on this list is get them the hell out of there. Get them off your list. How is, can I possibly get that off my list? If I can't get it off, can I dilute it? Can I reduce it? So it's not having an effect on me. Because you're trying to create an imbalance. You're trying to create a more strong upward push. So your resilience goes up into that safe zone and stays up nice and high in that safe zone. So there's your first bit of homework for you. <coughs> Do a bit of self-analysis on what are my protective factors? What are my risk factors? How do I strengthen my protective factors or get more of them? And how do I get rid of some of my risk factors or dilute them? Okay. Now, we're going to look at these three things in terms of taking control. So we're talking about taking the steering wheel on the plane. All right. And we're going to look at them health. And we're just talking about physical health here, by the way. Then we're going to look at mindset. And then we're going to quickly look at, at worry. All right. Because these are three, three parts of our life and our lifestyle that we really have to take control of. And it's our job to take control of them because we own all three of them. So in terms of physical health, and I know I'm going to get loads of answers here. What, we, what bubbles within physical health do you feel you could take a wee bit more control of? Because you're the pilot. Come on, hit me with some within physical health. Do you mean in terms of like exercise? You know, Drink your Lisa. Yes, there's one exercise. Something else. Um, your diet, healthy diet. Brilliant. Your diet. Come on, girls. Come on, come on, Campbell. Sleep. Sleep. So there's three exercise, diet, sleep. Come on, come on, come on, Kira. Is that it? Sharn, come on. Maria, that's it. That's it? <laughs> okay, wait till I see the ones I threw up. And that's fine. Look, here are the ones that, that I have threw up here. So the exercise one, you're taking control of that. You, by being on this program, are taking control of your exercise. But then you have all these other wee bubbles, all right? Somebody mentioned the diet. What about the hydration? Okay, mm -hmm. what about what, what I'm fueling my body up with as well as the food, the water intake, the hydration, the replacing the, the chemicals, the sleep you talked about. Now, my biggest issue with the sleep is as a TV in my room and the bloody Netflix. I get out, out. Oh, one more episode, go on, one more episode, and the next thing is three o'clock in the morning. That's why I can't get up at five like all. Okay, but sleep, very important. Hey, the alcohol, we all, same as that, like a wee drink, but we've got to take control of it. We've got to take control of it because it has an impact on our physical health. The smoking or the vaping, and even the personal hygiene, all right? Keeping clean, keeping yourself in order, 
All right. So that's so, so important. Now, I'm not going to go into these in any detail because I want to focus on the mental side of things. But these all have an impact on the mental side of things because these all have an impact on how you're feeling about yourself. And once again, guys, I'm not on here preaching. Definitely not. But what I am saying to you is you are truly the only person that can do proper analysis on how am I performing within each one of these wee bubbles. All right. And I'm not saying go and make big dramatic changes. I'm saying do the analysis and see, can I do a wee bit better in that one? Can I can I only have a bottle of wine the night or on Friday night instead of two bottles? Can I, you know, can I get a half an hour's extra sleep along the way? Can I clean up one meal in the day? And I know I'm attending my classes with Tom. Can I do something in myself in between? So just we small, sustainable, manageable changes. That's all we're asking for. Okay. So that's part of, and the one that I know that everybody will understand about taking control because you're the pilot and you're flying the plane. Then guys, we're going to go to mindset. Now, the thing about mindset is I could talk to you for 10 days about mindset, but I don't have 10 days of 10 minutes. So the area within mindset that I have chosen is emotions. And that's going to sound strange, a big baldy beardy boy on here talking about emotions. But emotions are so, so important. And taking control of them, because sometimes our emotions can take control of us and we become so overwhelmed that, that, we, that they, they stop us from doing things. So we're going to look at a, at a wee topic called practicing emotional agility. All right? And... Like everything, agility, if you're thinking about agility and movement, you know, it's the ability to move quickly and change direction and put your body into different shapes. And if I was coaching one of you here, I'd be saying, right foot in that hoop, left foot in that one, right foot in that one, left foot in that tuck in your heel, head up, chest out, drive forward, get low, power up off your hamstring, make sure you're connecting on the ball of your foot. And I could work with you here for three weeks and you come back and you might be a little bit more agile. It's the same with our emotions. We have to practice being agile with our emotions. Okay, that's what emotional agility is. Because at a time when we need to take control of them, you just can't click your fingers. You have to practice and you have to make mistakes and of, of the same way you would if you were become, trying to become more mobile or more uh, agile in your movement. So what is uh, emotional agility? Number one, it's your own individual ability to be compassionate, but curious about your emotions. And if you're being curious about anything, folks, you have to ask yourself questions. And usually when we ask ourselves questions, they're the hard ones to answer. It's easy asking other people questions. It's the ones we ask ourselves that are hard to answer. Why is it a time to, to practice emotional agility and not brush your emotions under the carpet? Because now is not a time to bottle them up. What happens when you bottle your emotions up? Don't deal with them. Hope they go away. Brush them under the carpet. They come and get you. When, when do they come and get you, folks? When do the emotions that you didn't deal with come and get you? When you least expect it. Brilliant. When you least expect it, when you least want it, and when you least need it. When you're having a bit of a downer, you see the ones that you didn't deal with three or six months ago? That's when they come and join the party. So it's so, so important that we become more agile with our emotions and dealing with them and taking bloody control of it. All right? And I want you to start trying to think of, can you treat your thoughts and your emotions and your feelings for what they are? And I don't know if you've given this any thought before in the past, but what are your emotions? Your emotions are data, information, statistics. And what are they giving you information on? They're giving you information, folks, on two things. What's important to you and what you value as a person. That's all your emotions are. They're giving you information. And if you start thinking about them like that and treat them like that, and then you can use that information. You can use that information so you can control your emotions and they don't control you. Here's one big example. Let's say I land up into the gym. You trained in the morning at six, Tom. Right, no. say I land up into the gym in the morning at six o'clock and you are all 
right, Wednesday. Ten to six, you are all there. Tom's not starting at six o'clock. I'm over and you're having a chat and I throw my big lug in to hear what you're saying. Do you see if I put my big lug in there and you are talking about something that's not important to me and I don't value as a person? Do you know where that information goes? Over my baldy head. And I never think about it ever again. It's not important to me. I don't value it. I don't create an emotion about it. Scenario two, exact same situation. I throw my big lug in now and you start talking about something that's important to me. Something I value as a person. You know what happens to that information, guys? It sticks. And it sticks right here. Boom. Maybe not immediately, but fairly soon, I'll take that information. So I will. And I'll process it. I'll start thinking about it. And I'll create an emotion about what that is there. There's a load of information. Because I was listening to it, oh, it was a great conversation. And that's the way our emotions work. And I want to show you maybe a wee technique of how you can get that information and use it. Now, we're going to play another game. And in this game, let me move that over to the side. In this game, we're going to play a word association game. So you can either, if you're using your phone, this is probably going to be tough for you to do. If you can get a pen, a piece of paper, or somewhere where you can just create a list of words. All right. I want you to be able to create a list of words that are for you and nobody else. All right. You need to write them or type them. So has everybody, does anybody need to get up and go and get anything? Hopefully not. Okay. Now, so you can get yourself a pen, a piece of paper, or use your device or whatever it is you're doing. But what you're going to do, folks, is you're going to create a list of words in a wee minute. All right. So listen to the rules very, very carefully. Right. So in a minute, I'm going to call out a word. And it's the same word for everybody in the group, right? And it's a word that you've been saying since you've been about two years of age, okay? Now, when you get the word, I don't want you to write that word down or type that word on your screen. But I want you to take that word, folks, and I want you to lodge it right here. Boom. Right in the front of your mind. And I want you to clear your mind. I want you to think about nothing else, right? So you're not typing it. You're just keeping the front of your mind. And what you're going to do is... You're going to write down or type down all the words that you associate with the word that you've got in your brain at the front of your mind. So you just keep going back to that word, write down another word, back up here, write down another one. And I want to see after a minute how many words you can get on your page. I hope everybody understands. Now, please don't start, and I'll trust you because I can't see everybody. Please don't start until I say go. Get you to go. Give you the start, right? Now, and the other thing is the words are just for you. So don't call them out. Don't send them to anybody. Don't share them with anybody. They're very, very personal. All right. Now, don't start yet. The word is dog. D-O-G. Don't write it down. Don't type it. Lodge it right in the middle and the front of your brain. Don't start yet. Now, there's, I think there's eight in the room or nine. Okay. And I want you to make a prediction. I want you to make a prediction. So everybody's going to unmute. And here's what I want you to make a prediction. I want you to make a prediction and tell me how many words do you think that we will have in common as a whole group after one minute about the word dog? All right. So Kira, how many of the words do you think we'll have in common as a whole group about the word dog? Um, six. Okay. Milena? <clears throat> Say 10. Uh, Lisa? I'd say 10 as well, yeah. Maria? 8. And Louise? 4. Yvonne? Um, 15. Campbell? 9. And Sharon? 5. And Tom? 3. Okay, you write that number down. That number that you said, that's the very top number on your screen or on your page. Okay, mute your microphone. I'm giving you one minute. Away you go. Start.
Ten seconds left. Okay, and stop. And I trust you. I trust you because I can't see you all. And we'll all stop. Okay, good work. Really good work. Now, this is what I want to ask you now. I need you, and there's no shame in this, by the way. I need you to count how many words you have on your sheet. How many words have you on your sheet? Because I need to know in the room who has the least amount of words in on their sheet. So, Kira, how many of you? Four. Has anybody, and I need you to be honest, has anybody less than four words on their sheet? No. Nobody. Okay, so we're going to work with Kira, right? So to have a word in common across the whole group, I said, how many words do you think we'll have in common about the word dog across the whole group? Everybody has to have it. So the most we can have is four. four. Because Kira's only got four. Now, this is how we're going to play the game, right? In a minute, Kira, I'm going to give you the thumbs up and you're going to call out your first word, all right? Everybody can unmute. Kira's going to call out her first word. If you've got Kira's word on your page, don't say anything. If you don't have Kira's word on your page or on your phone, you say no. Kira, give us your first word. <laughs> Family. Family. No. 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 Yeah, that's a lot of it's part of the family. It's okay. Don't you <laughs> yourself. That's four. So the most we can have now is three. Kira, give us your next one. Oh, no, I can't do this. Oh, Kira, you can. <laughs> I've had family. I've got friend. Friend. No. 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 <laughs> okay. The most we can have is two. Move Kira. on. <laughs> Come on, Kira. Come on. Give us another one. Cuddly. Cuddly. No. 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 Give us your last one, Kira. Caring. Caring. No. 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 Okay, Kira, thank you so much. Now, how many, words, how many words did we have in common, guys? Here, Tom, just to see Kira doesn't feel in fear. Give us one of yours, big man. <laughs> Lick. What? Lick. Lick, L-A-C-K. Say no if you don't have it, guys. No. <laughs> right. No. Okay. Now, here's the message, guys. Here's the message. How many words did we have in common? No. Zero. Zero. And I, I wait till I tell you, I could sit on here and I have played this game with groups of three, three family members who think they know each other inside out. Could they get a word in common about the word dog? No, they couldn't. Big groups, small groups. There was only one person in the whole room predicted that we'd have no words in common. Do you know who it was? Me. Never. And I have played this game thousands of times with thousands of different groups. Can anybody tell me why we couldn't or why anybody couldn't get a word in common? Perception. Now, look at poor Kira. She was, thought she was doing the right thing. Tell me, what has Kira's experience been of a dog? Cuddly, cute, <laughs> lovely, wee, family friend. Lovely experience. Somebody else, like Tom, might say, lick, shake, piss, bite, bark. His experience. Two of them. Yeah, two of them. But you see, Tom, I'm reading your mind. You see, you, you forgot that. So what I'm saying, guys, is it's all about perception. And I'm not even worried here about perception of experiences. I'm talking about the perception of words because words have serious power. And the things that you say about yourself to yourself or in public in front of other people have serious, serious power, whether you've thought about this or not in the past or not. So if we say positive words, if we say positive things about ourselves, we then in turn have positive thoughts. We think positive. And then in turn of those positive thoughts, we do positive things. Like the things you're doing now. Getting up in the morning, self-discipline, going to the gym. Before, I mean it, before lots of people are even thinking about turning around in their bed. You have your session done. So positive words equals positive thoughts equals positive actions. People laugh at me and they can laugh all the fuck they want. 
I say to my, I, I say to myself, my kids laugh and I beat my chest and I do it when I know they're watching. I say, I'm a machine. I'm a bloody machine. Because when I say that, what do you think I start thinking? The more I say it, what do I start thinking? I'm a machine. And if I think I'm a machine, how do I start behaving? Like a machine. That's the way I operate. And I'm telling you, there's enough people out there in the world that are going to tell you what you can't do. That you're not fit to do. You never do that. You'll not be able to do this. I'm getting it my whole life. So the one person that has to be positive is you. So say positive words. Think positive thoughts. Do positive things. But the, the big learning in tonight, folks, is it works exactly the same way with the negative shit. You talk negative stuff about yourself. Then you think negative things about yourself. And then you act negatively. So key message, stay positive, say good things about yourself in the mirror, out in front of other people. Don't give a damn about anybody. You the more you talk good about yourself, the better you feel about yourself. And then you start doing more positive things. And the reason why, why I've sort of covered that is I said to you, I would, I would help you with being curious, the questions to be curious about your emotions. So there's three questions, how you be you have to ask yourself to be agile with your emotions. Question number one sits right here. And that question is, what is this emotion? It's called a labeling question. You're trying to put a label on what is this emotion? Is it stress? Is it loneliness? Am I overwhelmed? Is it worry? Is it fear? You're trying to put a, a label on that emotion. And you have to keep, this is how you be agile. You ask yourself over and over again, is it stress? Is it worry? Is it loneliness? Is it fear? And when you think you've got the right answer to that question, you move to the next question in the process. And the next question sits right here, and it is, why? Why am I feeling more stressed than usual? Why am I feeling more lonely than usual? Why am I feeling more overwhelmed than usual? And to help you answer that question to why, folks, all right, remember what I told you. It's usually something important to you. It's usually something you value as a person. There might be something in this space that's making you feel that way, all right? There might be a void here that you're craving for something and you can't get it or it's not there that's making you feel this way. So that might help you answer the question to why am I feeling this way? And then once you feel you've got the answer to the why, you can move to the very last question that sits here. And maybe the most important question. This question is, what am I going to do about it? What am I going to do about the why? Don't tackle the emotion. Tackle the why. Tackle this one here. What is this that's in here that's making me feel lonely? That's making me feel negative? That's making me feel overwhelmed or worried or lonely? What is it? And get rid of it. What is it that's missing here that I need to get? So that's the questions you ask yourself. And you mightn't always get the right answers. But just by taking control and asking yourself them questions, you're taking the steering wheel off the plane. And you're flying the plane that's not flying you all over the place. So, and you might have to revisit that process over and over and over again. But just by doing that, you're taking control of your emotions. Okay, Tom, do I have time to move on to the last wee couple or 